Good afternoon. I'm Jay Rosen from New York University, and I'm totally late because I got lost. So I hope you'll excuse that. Um, Okay, this is Marius Dragomir. Hello. Director of Center for Media, Data, and Society in Budapest. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jay Rosen of NYU, as I said. And our title for this session is Diagnosing the Hate Movements in Journalism. That would be hate movements, plural, because there are many of them. And they differ from country to country. But they also have features in common. That is one of the questions we will ask today, and we hope that you will help us answer it. Our plan for the next 50 minutes is that I will speak for about 10 minutes about the American scene. Um, Marius will talk about the situation in Hungary and Europe a little bit, generally. And then uh, if anyone wants to give a brief summary of hate campaigns against journalists in his or her country, we would welcome you to do that. Let me start, then, with a quick definition. Hate movements involve the mobilization of resentment against a particular group of people for political purposes. I'm going to repeat it. The mobilization of resentment against a group of people for political purposes. When journalists are the group targeted, those of us who believe in a free press have a right to be worried and a duty to understand. I'm going to focus on the hate movement against journalists that President Trump is leading in the US. But I'm not saying that this kind of movement originated in America. I'm not claiming that it is anything new or that Trump's methods are some kind of innovation. I'm, I'm not saying that we have the worst case of it. We do not. I'm simply describing the situation in my country because I know it best. Our purpose today is to compare. So here are some of the features that stand out for me about the hate movement against journalists that our president is conducting in the United States. Tell me if any of these sound familiar. Trump's campaign to discredit the press comes to us disguised as the criticism of bias in the media. Defenders of Trump's attacks on journalists routinely tell me, you brought this on yourselves. You brought this on yourselves. They mean by being so biased. But what they mean by bias is not cases of unfairness or blindness that can be highlighted and corrected. They mean the complete evacuation of public responsibility by journalists. From their point of view, journalism is not reformable. It is corrupt and dangerous. Within the frame of this hate movement, no distinction is made between professional journalists and political opponents. Rather, journalists are political opponents, and that is the only thing you need to know about them. It is routine within the conservative movement. Sorry, I lost my space. It is routine within the conservative movement in the US 
to describe journalists as party operatives with bylines or political activists with press credentials. This was common before Trump, but he has weaponized it. Hate objects need fit names. You don't call immigrants refugees, you call them invaders. Before Trump, the hate object's name was the media, always with the word the first. Trump has been changing that name to the fake news, but the media is still common. That term, the media, doesn't refer to specific institutions like the Washington Post or the AP. It's like saying the banks or the military. The media has no address. It is a construct, not an institution. Hating on journalists the way Trump and his core supporters do is not an act of press criticism. It's a way of doing politics, often called populism. In populism, you aggregate and mobilize for political gain, people's resentment of elites who are described as corrupt and dangerous because they operate behind the scenes using unearned power. The leader promises to deal harshly with this despised group and deliver justice to the people harmed by these elites. One of the campaign promises that President Trump made in 2016 was to put these people down for you. He promised to deal with the press in the way that his supporters hoped they could. When Trump points to the reporters and camera crews at his rallies, he is presenting the hate object to his fans. It doesn't matter who the journalists are, where they work, or what their recent performance has been. This is not an act of criticism. It is a potent form of symbolic politics. It's like putting 20 bankers into a cage and dropping that cage into the middle of a political rally and then pointing at people inside the cage and saying, there they are, the banks. And when Trump says, there they are, the fake news, he's doing something very similar. The Republican Party has been practicing this form of politics since at least 1964. It is not new. What's different now is that mobilizing resentment is increasingly what holds the party together. And there's another factor, too. The Republican Party increasingly takes positions that guarantee conflict with fact-checking journalists doing their job. The clearest example is climate change denialism. When that becomes an orthodox position within the party, conflict with the press is guaranteed. Unless, of course, journalists retreat from truth-telling and evidence-gathering into he-said-she-said said journalism. Again, that dynamic forcing conflict with a fact-checking press was there before Trump, but he weaponized it. Every day he makes false claims that are easily checked Thousands of them so far. The Washington Post's count is over 8,000 at this point. The conflict with the press is therefore structural. It's built into the Trump presidency. If journalists do their job and point out the truth of the situation, they are helping Trump present them as hate objects. What his supporters see is journalists attacking their guy which enrages them. The only way to prevent this reaction is to abandon the job and just pass along what Trump said. 
Just the other day on Twitter, he said that Puerto Rico had received $91 billion in hurricane aid from the USA. The actual figure is $11 billion, and Puerto Rico is the USA. Previous presidents, Democrat and Republican, struggled with the press. They often thought of journalists as a class that was against them. Obama thought journalists were preoccupied with trivialities, like who's up and who's down. Nixon hated the press, but he kept it private. Previous presidents saw the press as a crucial part of American democracy, like free and fair elections, the rule of law, an independent judiciary. Trump attacks all these institutions. He undermines trust in all of them. But his hate movement against the press is conducted with a special intensity. It is basic to the way he governs. Now it's true that there is disgust and resentment coming at the American press from the left, too. That happens. Some of this criticism can be quite totalizing and dismissive. The difference is that the Democratic Party has never incorporated that rage into the way it does politics. We are not at war, we're at work. This sentence from Marty Barron, editor of the Washington Post, we're not at war, we're at work, captures perfectly how journalists think about this situation. Don't let Trump provoke you. Remain calm. Don't play his game. What Marty Barron's remark does not do is address the problem I have described here. If you do your job, you're playing the role of hate object and participating in Trump's political style. If you don't want to be a hate object, then you cannot do your job. Final point. Why does all of this matter? It matters because one-third of the American electorate has been isolated in an information loop of its own. For this group, which mistrusts the mainstream press as a matter of principle and as a matter of political identity, that is, they know who they are because they mistrust the mainstream press. For this group, Trump has become the major source of information about Trump, along with Fox News, which has slowly been merging with the Trump government. This means, for one third of the public, an authoritarian news system is up and running in the country that was once known for having the strongest free press protections in the world. So if any of that sounds familiar to you from your country's situation, we hope that you'll tell us about it later. Thank you, Jay. Um, well, um, I tried to uh, uh, pick up from the work that we are doing, the research that we are doing in the media in Europe, a few examples and a few methods um, uh, or, or features uh, of the kinds of attacks against journalists in Eastern Europe, but also across Europe, in fact. And this was a very <clears throat> interesting exercise because, uh, first of all, the, the, the types of attack that we thought are very effective are less effective today in Eastern Europe, and we see new types of, uh, uh, of attacks meant to discredit journalists that are, in fact, more effective uh, than, than they used to be. So what I'll, I'm going to do is, is just to, to, to basically share with you this, uh, the, the findings of this mapping exercise that, that I've done. Um, and I have five things, five trends, let's call them, or methods 
uh, used to discredit journalists that are, that are being used across the region. The first one and the most obvious, and I think many of you, of you are familiar with that because you see uh, coverage coming from, from Eastern Europe, is the, the outright uh, hate speech against journalists. And uh, you probably see all the time uh, headlines coming from Europe uh, where politicians like Robert Fico, former prime minister in Slovakia, call journalists all kinds of names, filthy anti-Slovak prostitutes. Uh, there, there is a, an obsession with hyenas in the region, by the way. All the politicians call journalists hyenas, idiotic hyenas. This is coming from the former Slovak prime minister. Uh, but we also had the president Miloš Zeman of the Czech Republic. You probably remember when he appeared in a news conference with the Kalashnikov on which he wrote, uh, he inscribed the word uh, journalists, the, the word uh, journalists, and in which uh, event he called them manure and again hyenas. Uh, and we, I can go on with these examples and, and we, you see them all the time, but um, let me just talk about the second trend which we found more effective than this name calling. And in fact, many journalists are laughing at that already. They expect journalists to, to call them th those names. And uh, this is, uh, so the second trend is the, the, what we call in, in Hungary, in, in the region, character killing smear campaigns that are run by, uh, usually by, by politicians and people in power. And this is um, uh, really an, an increasingly effective method to um, discredit journalists. It's very common in Hungary. Uh, in fact, when I prepared for this and we collected all the, uh, the, the data and information about this kind of campaigns, we realized how many years and how many examples of such uh, campaigns we have seen. Um, and it is, in fact, very creatively used by, uh, by pr the pro-government media to, to target journalists. Uh, studying this kind of campaigns, you, you find a few elements um, uh, to, to identify them. Most of them, they are designed to give the impression that they uncover well-hidden embarrassing facts about journalists. This is very interesting because they seem like sometimes investigative reports <laughs> about journalists. Um, and uh, of course, they are targeted to, to journalists who are very critical of the government or who work for news media that specialize usually in investigating the government wrongdoing. Um, secondly, when it comes to this kind of campaigns, we have identified the, uh, a few re recurrent structures that are used in stories in such campaigns. Uh, they used to be outright lies. They simply lied about journalists, but this is not common anymore. Uh, we see increasingly a, a more conspiracy theories in this kind of stories. And even more, uh, and I think this is a result of the, the fact-checking wave in, in the media and the fact that people have access to more information, we see a new model where, basic, where, where, they, where you, you, you have facts embedded in fabricated context. Increasingly, uh, such stories rely on, on a few facts uh, to, to discredit journalists. Again, these stories are published by pro-government media and sometimes, sometimes they are created to fill comment sections, that, so they are on purpose fabricated to, to do that. I have a lot of examples here. I'm not sure whether we can pull out one of, of these uh, articles to see how they, how they look like. Um, and um, uh, basically, th th these campaigns are used to, to instill distrust of journalists and help build uh, hate movements against journalists. And the reasons why they are effective are manifold, but let, let me just refer to, to two. One is the fact that governments have become very good and very skilled in running such campaigns. They tend to be credible, again, because they use facts in unmasking the real truths about, uh, about journalists. Uh, but secondly, they also refer to enemies or issues that trigger a lot of emotional reactions among regular people. In Western Balkans, for example, a, a region that, ha that was ravaged by war in the 1990s, there are many true believers who actually uh, f uh, genuinely uh, are convinced that they have to defend their country and they have to, uh, and they will react to such, to such reports associating journalists with mercenaries, spies, uh, traitors, enemies of the countries, and so on. So this is the Hungarian example. Uh, I picked up here a translation from Google Translation. I'm sorry, Hungarian is very difficult, so it's, it's very hard to translate that. But they picked up the, the key words, the editor-in-chief, Soros, Sargentini attacking Orban together. This is actually about uh, uh, an investigative journalist in, in Hungary uh, who, uh, who covered uh, a report by uh, a European parliamentarian about the, the government in Hungary. 
And in fact, in the story, you see a picture of the journalist with the MEP uh, posted on Facebook as a proof that actually this was planned against the government. Um, leaving uh, that uh, uh, second trend there, let me talk about the third trend, which is what I call the, the list of, of shame or the list obsession. In Eastern Europe, people have an obsession to, with making lists of... Uh, uh, with with the uh, with the uh, people who are against the government, against the the nation, against the the people, uh, this is in a way more or less related to the previous trend of of attacking people. But I I like to 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 I like to spend more time on that because it's a very it's a particularly effective form of attack and and isolation of journalists. It is not particularly targeted at journalists, uh, but at various enemies of the state. Uh, so they include the academics, NGOs, but journalists are always on, on this list. Again, in Hungary, we have a lot of examples. Uh, at some point in, in last year, a pro-government weekly, Figelo, published a list of 200 academics, representatives of NGOs, uh, but also journalists who are included on that list for only one quality, and that was uh, of being critical of, uh, of the urban government. And they were presented as the mercenaries of the uh, speculator. The speculator word was George. George Soros. It was, um, at first glance, such, uh, th this method looks, I would say, risible, because you just have a collection of names, and we, you would expect no one in, in their right mind to believe, to believe them, but in fact, this is a, uh, an equally powerful method of discrediting journalists for many reasons. First of all, it is very simple. You can, it is easily understood. It's a collection of people who are helping the country's enemies. Secondly, it's very easily, uh, is visually, uh, simple to absorb. You just have names and you go through them and you remember them from the media. Uh, and the third, it's, it gives the impression of a lot of work, a lot of sophisticated work and very complex investigative work. When you see so many names, 200 names, you think that journalists spent years putting them together and so on. Uh, talking about this, this specific list in Hungary, uh, this is not the case, obviously. In, in this specific case, they simply picked up, uh, copied and pasted names from various institutions. Uh, the university I work for had a lot of uh, professors on the list. Some of them, unfortunately, were, were dead already, so they, they basically picked up whatever they found. Uh, four, and I won't spend much time on that because the, even during this event we have a lot of great panels talking about that. This is the online threats and harassment against journalists. It's, it's, uh, uh, it has been increasing in recent years. It has become um, quite effective and it is document, documented by many organizations in the world. Um, but it's worth men mentioning the fact that usually these attacks follow journalists who cover sensitive issues. And we notice, uh, uh, at least in Europe and Eastern Europe, particularly those who cover topics that are um, uh, close to the right-wing agenda, such as migration in Italy, uh, EU in Hungary, migrants in Hungary again, and so on. And finally, five, um, it's the, the blame shifting. This is very complex, and we are looking into that, but it is a very interesting trend because it is a very sophisticated form of attack against journalists. And although it is not as powerful as the, the hate speech or online attacks, it is an equally powerful method of discrediting journalists. And uh, how does it work? It is usually employed by, by politicians and governments, officials and people, authorities, and consists of a shift of the blame from institutions or actors in charge of the public administrations to journalists with the goal of moving the blame uh, from those who are actually to blame. And this is happening usually in times of crisis when you know, governments are doing really bad in economic policies and so on and they have nothing to do but you know, shift the blame. It sounds in fact very simplistic but it is a very complex form of manipulation because it's not so easily done. It has to be done on a longer term uh, and in, in practice, it attains two goals at the same time. On the one hand, it subtly removes the responsibility for government actions. And secondly, it makes journalists responsible of these tasks, which is utterly stupid. You cannot expect people to believe that journalists are in charge of economic policies, but it happens in practice. And it really works with, uh, with people. This could take various forms from journalists made responsible for, again, economic problems or systemic government failure to conspiracy theories linking work of public administration bodies with journalists and their interests. Um, in Romania, for example, um, a while ago, some of the journalists were made responsible for supporting the work of an anti-corruption agency as part of a bigger uh, witch hunt campaign and so on.
We are studying these forms of blame shifting as they are more difficult to, to analyze and, and, and to identify, but uh, it seems to be an increasing trend and it's coming from political, uh, from political leaders. Looking at how this is moving, how this trend is moving across Europe, a very interesting um, uh, angle is, is uh, the premier of uh, Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, who actually has very close relations with some of the governments in the region, including the Hungarian government, and looking at the types of attacks and this form of attacks on, on journalists, there are many uh, similarities between him and some governments there. I will leave it there, and hopefully we'll hear about more okay. such stories. Um, thank you, Marius. Okay, so. Who has um, a question for us, or who has a report from his or her own country about similar trends? Yes, sir. So, um, microphone. We have a microphone coming, so please wait for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, when we're talking about hate movements, I mean, that sounds pretty harsh to me for the situation my country is currently in, mm -hmm. because I'm from the Netherlands, and we're... Well, we're really high on the press freedom index. I think we're like fourth or something, not sure. Yes. But, um, well, listening to this and knowing what this has led to in other countries as well, there's actually kind of a worrying trend uh, in the Netherlands as well because we might be at the start of something, mm. really. There's this right-wing party um, that has been attacking uh, academics, scientists, and journalists alike, uh, more vigorously over the past year. And th there's two sides to the story, really, because f you could say that journalists have been a bit too respected in the Netherlands mm -hmm. over time, which I personally would agree with. I'm a journalism student, but I'm also a far-left activist, so I can't say I love everything about uh, journalism. However, um, so it's not bad, it's not inherently a bad thing that there's conversation about bias in the media and stuff like that, which is how it's treated right now in the media. Uh, anyway, on the other hand, this is a party that whose platform is based upon, well, very real concerns, but very much not real facts. Mm. Uh, they gravely exaggerate migration numbers, they push aside 60 years plus of uh, science when it comes to climate change and so on the other hand you know that for this party to be popular they need their they need their target audience to distrust the press mm -hmm. and so the question is really where do you draw the line and I think that's a, if it was just discussion that would be fine but in a worrying twist of events they actually sort of won the election last month so now it's, the problem seems a bit more real for yeah. many Dutch people like myself. Yeah. Well, where do you draw the line? I think what I was trying to suggest is when all-out criticism of journalists becomes <clears throat> basic to the way that you do politics, as opposed to a complaint you have at, as someone in the political arena, but when it becomes basic to the political style a candidate or a party is using. That's where things get very dangerous. Um, I use a term sometime to describe part of what you said, um, verification in reverse. Verification in reverse. So verification, which is basic to journalism, is, is taking something that has been said and nailing it down with facts, documents, data. Verification is basic to how journalists do their job. Verification in reverse is taking something that's been nailed down and introducing doubt about it. And when you do that, you create controversy and, and, uh, and anger and reaction. And then you can use that energy released to power your political movement. Uh, and this is how Donald Trump began his political campaign. He began by questioning Obama's birth certificate, which was about as verified as anything can get. And by doing that, a lot of uh, energy was released, and then he tapped that energy for his political movement. You had a question. 
I'm sure you're going to get round to it anyway, but um, what, what do we do about it, bearing in mind that not all journalists are equal, different countries have different laws and regulation, so what might work in one country won't work in another? And how do we as educators guard against this? I mean, how do we help support our young journalists to deal with this? That is a great question. Uh, just quickly referring to the question before, because there is one very important thing about how media perform in Eastern Europe, and I totally agree it has to be a, a much more nuanced discussion about that, simply because unlike the US, uh, in countries like Hungary or Romania or many Eastern European countries, you have a lot, most of the media actually controlled by the government. So it is not, it is very difficult for the governments to actually refer to journalists as a, as a, as a mass or as a profession, simply because many of them are paid by them and, and are working for the propaganda channels. Uh, so you won't hear a lot of uh, generalizations when politicians talk about journalists. Of course, you have people like the Czech president and the, the former Slovak prime minister doing that generally referring to journalists, but they are very careful how they actually, uh, uh, how they actually uh, portray journalists or when they produce, that's why they produce lists because they want to refer to very specific people and, and they, they, they write about them in, in news articles. Uh, when it comes to what we are doing, what shall we do about that? I think, well, there is, uh, on, on the one hand, I think working more with, uh, we come from academia, working more with younger people, with students is very important. We are a small university based in, in, in Budapest and uh, we, we belong to this university as a research center they're also a small institution, but what we are trying to increasingly do is to engage journalists, uh, students in, in doing journalism. Although we know that many of them will not become journalists, but I think we have to do more of that. Uh, and uh, this is really uh, very effective for, for many reasons. And the most important one, for us at least, is the fact that when we decided to do that, we looked at students not only as, as, a, as a source of uh, skill and, and um, uh, a fresh view on, on, on the world and politics, but also we look at them as a source of audience because they come from communities. Uh, we, we are a small university, but we have students from more than 120 countries. So think about the students. They come from all these countries, from their own communities, their own families. Uh, this is audience. This, If you involve them in that, is not one or five journalists or five students, but you talk about five countries, five communities, and so on. Of course, that doesn't work if it's just one small institution in Budapest doing it, but I think if we can think about a way to, to take this, this concept of media literacy to, to a, a bigger stage and to, to connect these people, that would, would be one thing. Of course, there are many things to, to think about. There are many policy issues involved in that. I'm not going into that, uh, but um, this is one thing. On the other, on the other hand, I think it's, um, is the job of the, the independent journalism and independent news media to, to think about ways to better uh, work together in, in this field. And this is especially a problem in, in countries in Eastern Europe where the profession was divided and after the, the fall of communism. And this is, it was raised already in a few sessions here. I think that's also extremely important to discuss because if you work as uh, in isolation, you will never manage to, to fight these, these trends which are usually stronger than I would give three quick answers to your question. The first is <clears throat> we have to rebuild the relationship between journalists and their publics from the ground up, which includes the business model. Uh, secondly, um, substituting transparency for claims to authority or professional authority, it, I think is key, even though it won't convince the, the haters or persuade them. And then the third thing is I think journalists need to learn how to think politically about their institution. I don't mean that they should become political activists or that they should join a side. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean the kind of analysis that I tried to present here in which um, what's happening to them as journalists is a form of politics is something journalists have to learn how to figure out themselves, which is why we're not at war where at work is both true and false. You can try to ignore this dynamic, but it's going to envelop you anyway. So that's what I mean by learning how to think politically. Okay, who wants to give us another report? Yes, sir. Ma'am, sorry. Wait, we do need to wait for the mic, sorry. 
Thank you. I just have a question, actually, because I work in Germany, so I think it's a bit... I think there are other countries that have bigger problem, but problems. But uh, I'm just interested in whether these different governments that you're talking about, uh, is there any knowledge transfer with, uh, as to how they deal with the press? Uh, is there some kind of the Hungarians see what the Czech do, so they copy it? Is there, uh, you know if, if that exists? Of course, yes, absolutely. And this is the, this is, I think, the most, Uh, the most dangerous trend, the fact that uh, this kind of knowledge, as you call it, is, is being replicated and, and imported and exported. Hungary is a pioneer in that respect, not only in, in building this kind of hate movements against journalism but, uh, and journalists, but also uh, is, it's a pioneer in creating a model of, of uh, almost uh, total control of the media, which is being exported in Poland, for example. The Poles are looking into that and they already made steps to, con they, they control the public media and they made steps to take over more uh, private media Austria. outlets. Austria, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I mentioned the, the case, there are, there are things like that happening in Slovakia. You always had the problems of this kind in Bulgaria, so definitely, yes. What is important to say is that you cannot actually, uh, although it's a clear trend, it's very hard to actually nail the moment where this transfer of knowledge happens, because you cannot say uh, Orban today, the, today the Prime Minister of Slovakia decided to implement the Orban you know, uh, model, and he came to Hungary to do that. But in time, if you really look at the trends, definitely this is happening. And sometimes they are very outspoken about that. One of the a politician, a right-wing politician in Slovakia, not in, in fully in power yet, fortunately, uh, publicly said that uh, he admires Orban and he wants to do what he does in, in Hungary simply because those online media shouldn't write what they want. That's exactly what he said. Mm. Yeah, that would be terrible. Um, yes. Hi, Joan Donovan from uh, Harvard Kennedy's Shorenstein Center. Um, thank you for the panel. Really interesting and provocative thoughts. And one of the things that I'm interested to hear your response to is to think about, particularly in terms of the way in which the knowledge transfer happens amongst these groups, is they figure out a tactic that works, and then they do it over and over and over again, usually using platforms as the cudgel, right? So one of the ways in which uh, hate movements organize online is simply to get journalists to turn off their social media and to silence them. And so I'm wondering from you both, what is the role of platforms here and where do you think some lawn lines are bright and w some lines are a little bit, going to be a little bit harder to um, adjudicate? Do you want to try? Um, again, I, I, when you speak about platforms, I guess you talk about the, the large distribution platforms like social media and, and so on. So if you refer to that, yes, definitely they had a role in, in amplifying the voices of, this, um, uh, of, of political actors and right-wing Uh, right-wing politicians. At the same time, they were helpful to, to a certain extent for, for news media in this region to uh, distribute their news, news content, although they, they badly damaged the business model of many news media in the region. Uh, but also what I want to stress is the fact that this should be understood in the, the, the overall context of the region where you have a lot of the uh, large parts of the media market, you have the public service media, uh, and you have the government funding a lot of this media. So you have a very high level of of government control of the media, which basically ensures that they have a very powerful platform to, to disseminate these messages. In other words, it's very easy for them to actually have implement effectively these messages simply because they control in Hungary between 60 and 80 percent, 90 percent of the media. Mm -hmm. um, well, when it comes to attacks on journalists, I don't think we need special rules or special analysis for journalists as a class because Uh, the platforms have the same responsibility to protect activists or minorities or uh, victims of any kind. Um, so I don't think there's, there's, there's an analysis that, that treats online um, harassment of journalists as, as any different than online harassment of others. Um, where especially Facebook has a lot of problems is in dealing with the asymmetry of this situation, which is that attacks or the hate movement against journalists in the U.S. is coming from the right. 
but Facebook wants to live in a world where uh, left and right are kind of equal and balanced and it can um, sort of play it right down the middle. And if you try and tell people from Facebook that that world doesn't exist, they just won't listen to you or they'll just pretend that you didn't say anything. Um, because they, they don't have any way of uh, accepting or, or um, understanding political asymmetry. Uh, and as um, uh, Norm Ornstein uh, said, uh, a, uh, a balanced treatment of an unbalanced phenomena distorts reality. And this kind of distortion is invisible to Facebook. They, they can't cope with it. They don't know uh, what to do about it. We have one minute left. Can you give us a good question or comment? Wait for the mic. Oh, call in this person in the front row. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shoma Basu. I'm an investigative journalist from India, and we are seeing the same kind of phenomena, what Mr. Trump is doing in US, Narendra Modi is doing in India, and there is exact similarity, obsession with list. So there is hashtag Jaichand list on Twitter, which lists out, you know, gives out names of journalists, uh, uh, you know, who should be targeted. And the narrative is anybody who's anti-government is anti-national, and more so after the Pulwama terrorist attack. On 14th February 2019, there was a terrorist attack in India, in Jammu and Kashmir, in which 44 uh, security, you know, paramilitary personnel were killed. And after that, you know, uh, the, there was this almost warlike situation between India and Pakistan, and there were airstrikes air uh, carried out by India on, at the Pakistan border. And then, then BJP ministers, uh, you know, they started claiming that we have killed 300 terrorists, we have killed 400 terrorists. And when the journalist asked them, where do you get your number from? Because Pakistan is denying any kind of casualty. And they said, you are uh, questioning the, you know, the honor of our army men, so you are an anti-national. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've just finished you know, analyzing uh, uh, over 60,000 messages from WhatsApp uh, for a project that I was doing at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Uh, and during the seven-day period, uh, you know, from 14th February, the day of the attack, until uh, the airstrikes, the, there were over 41% of uh, uh, you know, messages that attacked individuals. So uh, people would you know, call up journalists, their phone numbers were circulated on WhatsApp, and these are encrypted, WhatsApp is an encrypted platform, so nobody can really do anything about it. So a list was uh, circulated on WhatsApp with the phone numbers and the question that people should be asking the journalists. Uh, and then, uh, you know, once the call was made, the call record recording was posted again, uh, you know, encouraging other people to call an abuse journalist. So these kind of harassments are also going on, you know, and social media is a terrain which, uh, no matter what the platforms say, that we are for formulating policies or whatever, implementation is really low. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, our version of that is that the Trump government is now threatening to go after and, uh, and publicly humiliate journalists who were wrong about the Mueller report. And they say they have all of the tweets showing how irresponsible these journalists were, and they're going to like buy advertisements and try to publicly humiliate them. This is what they say they're gonna do. We haven't seen it happen yet, um, but it's sort of in the same vein, although not as, not as serious as what you described. We are out of time. Marius, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. So sorry I was late. I